Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Monday and we woke up to uh, very, very sad news of uh, the death of uh, Colin Powell at the age of 84. Just an extraordinary figure, uh, not just in the history of the U.S. military, but in American history. Uh, this is uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin commenting on the uh, passing of Colin Powell this morning. We, we will certainly miss him. I feel as if I have a hole in my heart uh, just, just learning of this uh, just recently. First African-American uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, first African-American secretary of state, a man who was respected around the globe and who will be, uh, quite frankly, it is not possible to replace a Colin Powell. Our guest today is Ben uh, Schreckinger, who is the national political correspondent for Politico and author of a new book, The Bidens, Inside the First Family's 50-Year Rise to Power. Ben, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it very much. Charlie, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, I want to I want to get into the book um, and um, sort of the, the strange media environment you find yourself in um, at, 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 at the moment. Um, there's a lot going on, but let, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, Colin Powell, because you know, it is fascinating looking back over his career and, and all of the multiple legacies. I mean, here's a guy's a four star general. He served under five different presidents. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was national security advisor. He was secretary of state, decorated combat veteran, author of the Powell Doctrine. Really kind of a throwback figure of statesmanship, but obviously somebody who was not afraid to dip his toe into into politics. I mean, really almost a unique figure in recent political history, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, I think his passing is another milestone in the evolution of the Republican Party. Uh, there are not a lot of other uh, Colin Powell type figures left in the party uh, as Trump continues to uh, apparently uh, maintain a hold on it. And, and so uh, I think that... Um, I think that his passing from the scene sort of just hammers home that we are in a new political reality now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really inconceivable to imagine somebody like a Colin Powell being part of the current uh, Republican Party or or really any, any time in, in the foreseeable future. And of course, uh, he did break with Republicans. He broke uh, back in 2008 when he when he endorsed uh, Barack Obama. So he's in, in some cases, he's I mean, in, in some you know circles, he's kind of a, a pariah because of all of that. But I, I, I think what's interesting about Colin Powell is, you know, Lloyd Austin, you know, mentioned, you know, all the first, the first African-American. And, and of course, that's the way history is going to remember him. But also he was such a consequential figure. I was listening this morning to people in the military talking about his legacy, the way that he rebuilt the military, uh, brought it back. From you know the, the Vietnam era, the 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 development of the, the the Powell Doctrine, which is really, I mean, the Powell Doctrine is something that the the media called it, uh, not you know something that, that he called it, but you know the way that he shaped our thinking, you know, the Powell Doctrine basically being you know is vital national security interests threatened, you know, do we have clear all alternative, uh, you know, attainable objectives, you know, have we, uh, do we have genuine broad international support? Is the action supported by the American people? I mean, this is somebody who really crossed the lines from uh, being a military figure to being a statesman to being a really a, also kind of a, a political conscience. Can I just play one soundbite that I, I, I think is just sort of representative of, of Colin Powell's willingness to get out of his comfort zone? This is from 2008. And this is, again, during the campaign between John McCain and Barack Obama, where, where he's talking about... Well, this speaks for itself. This is Colin Powell, and I think he's on Meet the Press here back in 2008. I'm also troubled by not what Senator McCain says, but what members of the party say. And it is permitted to be said such things as, well, you know that Mr. Obama is a Muslim. Well, the correct answer is he is not a Muslim. He's a Christian. He's always been a Christian. But the really right answer is, what if he is? Is there something wrong with being a Muslim in this country? The answer is no, that's not America. Is there something wrong with some 70-year-old Muslim American kid believing that he or she could be president? Yet I have heard senior members of my own party drop this suggestion. He's a Muslim and he might be associated with terrorists. This is not the way we should be doing it in America. I feel strongly about this particular point because of a picture I saw in a magazine. It was a photo essay about troops who were serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
And one picture at the tail end of this photo essay was of a mother in Arlington Cemetery. And she had her head on the headstone of her son's grave. And as the picture focused in, you could see the writing on the headstone. And it gave his awards, Purple Heart, Bronze Star, showed that he died in Iraq, gave his date of birth, his date of death. He was 20 years old. And then at the very top of the headstone, it didn't have a Christian cross. It didn't have a Star of David. It had a crescent and a star of the Islamic faith. Hmm. And his name was Kareem Rashad Sultan Khan. And he was an American. He was born in New Jersey. He was 14 years old at the time of 9-11. And he waited until he can go serve his country, and he gave his life. You know, that, as I was listening to that, Ben, I was thinking that was seven years before Donald Trump stood up and said, I, Donald J. Trump, am proposing a complete ban on all Muslims into the United States. It was seven years before then. He was kind of, you know, waving a, a red flag. Hey, don't go this way. But of course, as you point out, the Republican Party has definitely gone in a very, very different direction than Colin Powell. Yeah. You know, the the other sort of counterpoint to that Colin Powell so- soundbite is, uh, Trump's feud with the Khan family, which is not yeah, uh, the same Khan family, but it's the same surname, mm-hmm. uh, another uh, Muslim American gold star family. Uh, and it's it's really night and day. Uh, and just to have a, a senior Republican going on a morning show and, and dissenting, calling out party leaders um, on a topic like that is not something uh, you would see often now. And if you did, there would be incredible, incredible backlash uh, against them for doing so. No, I mean, I, I want to get to the Biden and, and, and your book and rather the extraordinary reporting in, in your book. But just a couple of other just thoughts about about Colin Powell. N- number one is that, you know, certainly one of the more memorable moments in his career was when he testified that there were, in fact, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And there's a lot of, you know, tape of that going around right now. But the interesting thing is that I don't think that Colin Powell's life or career will be defined by that. And I, th- this is important because I think that there's sometimes that tendency to define someone's life and their whole career by one moment, one thing they did. And his career is so long and so rich and so varied and the contributions are so significant that even though that's there, it's just one blot, but not a defining moment. That might it might have been a defining moment for other leaders getting that one so wrong. Do you know where I'm going on this? I mean, yeah, yeah. I think the fact that he has reckoned with it publicly uh, is important in sort of putting that in context. The fact that uh, he uh, has had such a long and storied career um, clearly, it's something that needs to be reckoned with. Clearly, it's something that he uh, tried to reckon with and come to some sort of terms with. Uh, in the years after it happened, but clearly just one moment, though a notable one yeah. in his life. Yeah, I mean, it's well, yeah, it's, it's it is certainly notable, but obviously, I'm sure it was in the back of his mind as he, as he went forward. Uh, the uh, the headlines today, of course, is that he died at the age of 84 of complications from COVID, despite being fully vaccinated. I, I think some of that is misleading because, of course, he was also diagnosed with multiple myeloma which is a type of blood cancer mm-hmm. that really hurts the ability to fight infection. So there's a lot going on there. And I think there's, I kind of feel it's almost reckless for uh, media commentators to talk about the vaccination without mentioning that, well, there was a lot else going on there. So I, I, I don't think that this undermines the case for vaccinations in any way, but I guess that's, that's the world that we live in. Okay, so Ben, let's talk about your book. Your book is about the Bidens. It's interesting. There have been so many books about the Trump era. There haven't been that many deep dives into the man who's the president of the United States right yes. now. So give me your rationale for writing the book. Um, what what you were, you know, I, my, my, I saw you were quoted in in the uh, in Politico's playbook as, you know, talking about the Americans having this great man view of presidents, these towering figures who bend history to their will by, you know, their extraordinary personalities. But tr- the Trump era kind of exploded that 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 myth around the presidency. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, I wanted to understand Joe Biden in his context, because I do think that uh, there can be this uh, overly individualistic view as presidents and this sort of mythology about them as as individuals. Uh, and for Joe Biden, his context uh, is so often his family. And that's um, may sound obvious, you know, family mm-hmm. is, is important to, uh, 
to everyone, more or less. But w- with Joe Biden, the centrality of his family uh, to his political life uh, and to his political image and the public understanding of him uh, really is uh, extraordinary. Um, and so I thought that was the right right lens for understanding him. Uh, and this also comes in the context of reporting I was doing for Politico starting during the Democratic primary, um, but really all the way through to Election Day uh, that uh, was looking at business dealings of various relatives. And uh, I sort of found some of what I found hard to square with this folksy image of Joe Biden um, and the story of his family. Uh, There were a lot of dealings over the years, really going back to Joe Biden's first term in the Senate uh, that raised questions at the time or raised questions in hindsight about whether they were getting favorable treatment or... Mm -hmm you know, taking sweetheart deals from people who uh, had an interest in incurring favor with Joe Biden. And so I wanted to to integrate what I was finding with um, with some of the more familiar elements of the Biden family story and try to tell the whole thing. Well, I want to put this in some context because, uh, you know, and, and this, this may seem like a digression, but it, but it, it, it is, at least in my head, the uh, the story about Katie Couric, who is protecting um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, not reporting certain comments she had made. And I do wonder whether or not, you know, once again, we're being reminded that that there's a media culture that will, in fact, you know, pull their punches when it comes to people on their side. And the things have become so polarized in the Trump-Biden era that, uh, that, that there has been a reluctance to look more carefully into some of these things like Hunter Biden's, his ethical issues, the whole laptop thing. And I'm really struck by your book, which has, I, I, I think, it appears to be meticulously reported that a lot of the mainstream media folks haven't really you know, written about your book. I mean, the New York Times, Washington Post haven't written a review of your, your book. And yet I noticed that, you know, the New York Post is running an excerpt, uh, National Review, Newsmax have run stories. This must be kind of a strange world for you because you are certainly not pro-Trump in any way whatsoever. Weren't you kicked out of his rallies at one point? Yeah, I was I was on the very early end of experiencing the Trump treatment of the press and was kicked out of a couple of rallies, condemned in a in a stump speech, condemned in a tweet uh, of his. Uh, so, so you got good credentials. You have good credentials on all of this. And, and yet somehow I'm just picking up a real continuing reluctance to do the kind of reporting on Joe Biden that we might have expected from any other political leader who is this powerful. Do you you get a sense of that? Do you want to wing well, on that? You know what I will say is that I'm I'm you know very grateful that at Politico the the you know the marching orders have always been report without fear or favor, or follow the facts. Yeah. You know if there's something newsworthy, continue to report it out. Um, and was able to do uh, you know roughly a dozen stories, many of them quite lengthy and in depth. Um, on the relatives' business dealings or other, uh, you know, Joe Biden-related explorations when he was running for president, uh, to the extent that others aren't covering it, um, I guess maybe that's for me helpful. It, you know, it gives me more space to to cover this waterfront myself. But obviously, I could understand if, if as a reader or consumer of news media, uh, that's frustrating to you. Well, no, I mean, it's also I, I, I think it's a cautionary note for, you know, people in the in the mainstream media who are having a credibility problem. Look, um, you know, stories like the correct story, I think, you know, really feed the narrative because it is the narrative. And and the fact that, you know, kind of turning a blind eye to the fact that Hunter Biden is is genuinely a problematic figure uh, is not a good idea um, if if you really want to you know, tell people that you are reporting with fear or favor. So one of the things that I thought was very interesting about your book was your discussion of the Delaware way. And uh, I guess, you know, you can't really understand Joe Biden or who he is or where he comes from without understanding what you call the Delaware way. So Ben, tell us a little bit about that. What did you find out about that political culture that produced Joe Biden? Yeah, I found Delaware just fascinating in general. You know, it's just up the road from Washington. It's not too far from New York City, these massive global power centers. Um, But it's really a a quiet, small place where uh, everybody knows everybody and and people uh, tend to have multi-generational ties to one another. Uh, And out of that place, you get uh, what's been termed in the last 50 or so years, the Delaware way. Um, And it really refers to a very consensus-based, bipartisan, genteel, 
way of conducting business and politics where you get uh, people around a table and they work out an agreement. And this is something that uh, Joe Biden has touted explicitly as a model for Washington, saying, look, our national politics has grown too acrimonious. What we need in Washington is the Delaware way. Um, But the Delaware way has its critics in Delaware uh, who say that this amounts to cronyism. Um, One thing that I thought was fascinating is that there's a a little known case from uh, the early Obama era where a bundler for Joe Biden's uh, abortive 2007 Democratic presidential primary run, it just barely makes it into the beginning of 2008 before he drops out, um, gets put away by the feds in Delaware for making illegal straw man donations uh, to Biden's campaign, among among some other charges. Um, and in a filing in that case, the prosecutor defines the Delaware way as a form of soft corruption. Hmm. Uh, and so that's not that's not the way uh, that Joe Biden uh, and you know the Delaware boosters are describing the Delaware way, but that's sort of the view from the the U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware. Uh, and what's even more interesting to me, or, or what makes this even more interesting, is that that prosecutor uh, is David Weiss, who's also currently the U.S. Attorney in Delaware, who's a holdover um, from mm-hmm. from the Trump era, who's been left in place because he is in charge of the uh, investigation there of Hunter Biden's tax affairs. Well, you know, a lot of presidents have come out of uh, political environments that you could describe as not just soft corrupt, but pretty bad. I mean, you know, Barack Obama came out of the Illinois Democratic Party. Uh, uh, Harry Truman, you know, famously came out of the major, you know, the Missouri, uh, was it the Pendergast machine, without necessarily themselves being corrupt. So make the distinction there. So, you know, Joe Biden comes out of this world. That doesn't mean that he is part of it in that way. Or what did you find? Yeah, that's right. You know, I, he has not been taken down by any sort of scandal. He's had some allies in Delaware who have, over the years, uh, encountered scandal or allies in labor and that sort of stuff. He has mostly steered clear of that. Uh, there is not, uh, you know, there is not evidence of egregious wrongdoing by Joe Biden uh, from an ethical perspective. Um, but there are a lot of questions and and. One aspect of the Delaware way that's been criticized is sort of a blind spot for conflicts of interest. Um, and so when Hunter Biden is taking, you know, a board seat at Burisma and this is being raised as an issue uh, internally by a career State Department official and he's being rebuffed by the vice president's office, as George Kent uh, has testified mm-hmm. that he was. Um, and uh, Joe Biden is going out there and, and sort of angrily on the campaign trail saying, my son did nothing wrong when he gets confronted by a, a voter uh, during the Democratic primary. Uh, you can sort of see this clash of perspectives where uh, from Joe Biden's perspective, it sounds like his son did do nothing wrong. But uh, from the perspective of ethics experts who are now pointing to you know the pitfalls of, of this venture into painting, for example, um, they're saying, no, this this does raise at least the appearance of a conflict of interest. And at you know the highest levels of government, that's an issue. Yeah, I want to I want to come back to all of that. So you, you, you use the term the, the blind spot. What is your sense about uh, his his willingness to sort of look the other way about some of the stuff that Hunter has been involved in? I mean, how does it play into the obviously tragic loss of his son, Bo, which uh, was, you know, obviously a, a shattering experience for him, which he you know talks about frequently. Do you get the sense that because of his loss of Bo, because of the other tragedies in, in his family, that that uh, he, he, you know, that that colors his tolerance for Hunter Biden? I think I think so. I think that a family that has endured these sorts of losses together, um, it it creates an even closer bond than than some other families might have. Um, and you see evidence of this. You see when he decides to remain in the Senate even after this accident uh, at the end of 1972 that takes the life of his, mm-hmm. his wife and his infant daughter, um, he's coping with the fact that he's going off to Washington while he still has these two young sons in Delaware that his uh, siblings are largely raising uh, in conjunction with him. And he creates a rule called wild card. And at any time, um, Bo or Hunter or later, later Ashley can say wild card. They don't have to go to school. They can go with their father to Washington, sit in on mm. meetings with him. Um, and, and you see this sort of thing again. Uh, I think it was in the Adam Entis profile of, of Hunter Biden. He, he, 
um, cites some people who are working for Joe Biden, uh, and this is on background, they're not named, Mm -hmm. but they say that when this Burisma issue came up, no one wanted to take it to Joe because Bo Biden had just died and it Mm -hmm. was just too sensitive of a time. Um, And so I, I do think that, yeah, understanding this family dynamic and, and the ways in which it's contributed to, um, you know, the, the current dilemmas for the white house around Hunter Biden's activities, you do have to understand these, these tragedies. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not a paradox that, that he's an incredibly devoted father and grandfather, but, but he may have blind spots. I mean, that, that seems to be very much the other side of the, the, the same coin. Uh, so Brett Stevens in the New York Times did write about your uh, your your book, and he he called it a scrupulously reported book. And it says, and and this is the part that I think has gotten a lot of people's eyebrows up, uh, is that is that you make a compelling case that some of those the most explosive emails from Hunter Biden's purported laptop were in fact entirely genuine, uh, a claim that uh, that you confirmed with multiple sources, including a Swedish government agency. And that has never been explicitly denied by Hunter himself. And Stevens, among others, points out that the media gave way too much credence to the claims that the emails were a Russian plant. So what 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 is the story with the laptop? Because there was a lot of uh, reluctance to write about them. Some of the people who did write about them um, appeared to have, uh, you know, a sketchy relationship to the truth. So <laughs> based on your reporting, what what do we know about that laptop and some of those emails? So, yeah, what I can say is that at least some of the material uh, in that cache of leaked files is genuine. Um, I confirmed with someone who for a time had independent access to Hunter Biden's emails uh, that he did receive an email uh, about a proposed equity breakdown in a venture that he was pursuing at the time um, that appears to have not fully been consummated um, with a Chinese oil executive, Yu Jinming. Uh, that includes a line 10 held by H for the big guy. Um, and that's the one, that's the email where Tony Bobulinski 10 already, held by H for the big guy, H being Hunter, big guy, what, you know? What? Well, according to Tony Bobulinski, who uh, was a recipient of that email and was in business with uh, Jim and Hunter Biden for a time on this, on this abortive deal, um, that did mean that Hunter was going to hold 10% on behalf of Joe Biden, or that was the plan under discussion. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign has said he's never even considered uh, doing something like that, having a a relative hold equity for him, Um, which raises the question of if that's the case, you know, why, why was this email sent? Who was discussing this? Was this something that Hunter uh, was telling his business partners he was planning to do? Uh, We haven't heard from Hunter Biden on this. And there, there's a, another another of these early New York Post emails uh, was one in which a Ukrainian businessman who was an advisor to Burisma uh, is writing Hunter Biden saying, oh, was, thank you for the chance to meet your father last night. Um, I confirmed with, with the same person that uh, Hunter did receive an email along those lines. Uh, the Biden camp has said that Joe Biden has never had a meeting with Vadim Pisarsky. Uh, there is some evidence suggesting that they were both slated to attend a, a dinner uh, the night before that email was sent in April of 2015 at Cafe Milano in Georgetown. The Washington Post has reported that uh, Joe Biden did stop by that dinner that Hunter Biden was present at. Uh, Post story cast doubt on the idea that Pizarski was there. Doesn't really weigh down decisively either way. I spoke to an attendee who said he doesn't remember Pizarski being there. That name doesn't sound familiar, um, but that he's not sure. Uh, the identities of the other people. He doesn't really fully remember most of the identities of the people who were there that night. Um, I asked I asked that attendee, Rick Leach, who had worked with mm-hmm. Hunter Biden on some philanthropic efforts, do you have any emails, communications from that time that might shed light on who was there? And he said, you know, I've said all I have to say about this. Um, so we just don't know exactly what happened. So Hunter Biden really got around. Um, <laughs> one yeah. of the more extraordinary little details in your book is that was Hunter Biden actually kind of friends or an acquaintance of Tucker Carlson? And, and I did just say that sentence. There's some tie between Tucker Carlson and Hunter Biden. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. So uh, Hunter Biden and his first wife, Kathleen, were uh, neighbors of Tucker's family in Washington uh, for many years, um, were quite friendly. This is something that, that Tucker has mentioned on air in, in passing, at least. Mm-hmm. 
um, I said, oh, you know, I, I like, I actually like Hunter Biden. Um, but what, what I found on this laptop that was interesting to me, given the prominent role of uh, Tucker Carlson in, in, you know, reporting early uh, on this New York Post laptop reporting is uh, their friendship was even closer than that, judging by an email in which Tucker is thanking Hunter uh, for writing a, a letter to Georgetown on behalf of a, a younger relative. Um, and in the context of this book, which is sort of about, you know, the Bidens going from being a, a very normal American family to being sort of on the inside of uh, the American, you know, the American elite. Uh, a letter, you know, writing someone's relative a letter to Georgetown, uh, you know, in the college admissions process, that's about as big a favor as someone can do for for another person. So my overall takeaway from this is that, you know, Hunter Biden is extremely problematic, has lots of issues that do not necessarily implicate Joe Biden anyway, except that he's he's an indulgent um, and loving father who who may, again, you know, turn a blind eye to all of this. But number two, um, th- this, this does raise questions about the reporting. The New York Post initial reporting raised all kinds of red flags. You know, Rudy Giuliani was involved in that. Uh, wasn't there a story that had no byline? I mean, it just was weird. And then the rest of the media just sort of going along with the, that the laptop must be Russian disinformation when at least some of it was true. So this raises some questions for me, about the way the media is going about covering this. And I, I think this is something that needs a little bit more introspection than, than we've gotten so far. Do you agree? Yeah, I think the reception of the laptop will be studied for a long time to come. Uh, I think that there are reasons for the incredible skepticism that this was greeted with. Uh, there had already been reporting that Rudy Giuliani and, and, and pushing his claims about the Bidens in Ukraine had been in touch with a, a, Russian, a Russian proxy. Uh, there had been uh, some sort of warning of, of possible hacked emails sure. that, that were being shopped around in Eastern Europe. But yeah, I think that the fact that many, many people still have the impression uh, that these emails were debunked as fake or that the intelligence uh, community uh, concluded that they were Russian fakes, which is not a, a, a conclusion that was actually stated in, in this report after the election about, about foreign interference. Um, just speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, in, in general, there could have probably been better communication and, and more careful reporting, uh, trying to suss out, um, you know, what was real, what could be confirmed here, what couldn't be confirmed. Well, I also want to talk about some of your reporting that I think is really genuinely puzzling and really does raise questions about Joe Biden and the Biden White House's anti-corruption push. But let's do this first. If you're a fan of this podcast or any of our other podcasts here at The Bulwark, I really think you're going to enjoy our newest edition. It's called The Focus Group, and it's hosted by our own Sarah Longwell. Maybe you've heard Sarah talk about these focus groups that she conducts, but now she's actually sharing real audio from the participants. It's a great show, and I know you're going to love it. Again, it's called The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you consume podcasts. Okay, we are back with Ben Schreckinger, who is a national political correspondent for Politico, author of the new book, The Bidens, Inside the First Family's 50-Year Rise to Power. You have some more recent reporting, uh, including a recent lengthy piece in Politico about the the ethical questions around Hunter Biden's paintings. I find this an incredibly strange story, you know, that, that Hunter claims to have this art career, whatever. And some of the amounts of money that he may be collecting for his paintings, uh, there are estimates out there of up to a half million dollars. I mean, like, who's going to pay a half million dollars for a painting by Hunter Biden? And it it does it does seem squirrely. So tell me what's what's going on there and why you think it complicates uh, Biden's anti-corruption push. And so Hunter Biden has worked as a lawyer. He's worked as a lobbyist, as an investor. Um, and now he is debuting as a professional painter and, uh, painting and artistic expression is something he's had an interest in, um, for at least a few years. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, a pretty dramatic career pivot and 
uh, his his artworks are reportedly being listed for anywhere from about seventy five thousand dollars to half a million dollars per work, um, okay. and that what? is a a truly yeah a truly extraordinary sum for a debut artist. I mean, literally, uh, no one is going to pay that kind of money for a painting unless it's by Hunter Biden. So he is clearly I'm I'm sorry he is clearly trading on his father's name, right? I mean, how how does this not you know. I understand that people are going, why are you talking about this? But really, this is happening in real time. There are people paying six figures for a painting by this guy. There's only one reason, right? It's because his name is Biden, right? I mean, and the, the question, you know, the one, the one concern, the more mild concern is, you know, is this trading on the notoriety of your name or, you know, just on the idea that someone would, would want to have something by a presidential relative, a painting by a presidential relative. But the the real concern that's been raised by ethics experts, the more serious concern, uh, is that this could be some pathway for somebody who wants to ingratiate themselves with the president to overpay for a painting by his, his sole surviving son. And so then the question becomes, who is buying this art exactly? Right. And, and the White House has said that Hunter's representatives have have come up with a system where the buyers will be anonymous. And this drew objections from ethics experts who said yeah. uh, the public should know who's paying. Someone is paying half a million dollars for these paintings. The public should know who it is. Uh, the White House has said, well, it'll be anonymous from the public, but Hunter Biden also won't know who, who's buying them. And that will alleviate okay. influence sure. concerns. Um, but there was a wrinkle to that because it was CBS News that first reported that uh, in fact, Hunter will be meeting face to face with prospective buyers. And the White House said, "Well, those conversations <laughs> won't pertain to the buying of art, um, but obviously that that further under, undermines the anonymity of the process." And some ethics experts have said, "You know, it's not really credible that uh, that if Hunter Biden is meeting face to face with prospective buyers that they don't have some way of signaling to him if they if they were to buy something." And, and yeah. they have concerns about this. So I, I can imagine people, you know, screaming right at us right now going, well, well, what about Don Jr. and Eric and Ivanka Trump? Well, exactly. But this is the thing about standards. If you're going to have standards, you need to apply them across the board. And that's what, you know, and, and, and of course, that was outrageous. That was one of the worst elements, I think, of the cacistocracy of the Trump years is the way that you had these kids who are clearly trading on the presidency and marketing and um, but that doesn't mean, therefore, that we need to turn a blind eye to this. What I don't get is why senior officials in the White House don't just say this is not worth it. The risk reward ratio just makes no sense whatsoever. You know, it, it's not like I mean, Hunter has caused enough problems, has been enough of a liability. Why would you let this go forward? Because clearly this is pretty easy. Somebody walks in, pays five hundred thousand dollars for a Hunter Biden picture. Why are they doing that? You know, and then and then to keep it secret from the public, which makes it worse. So is this just another case where Joe Biden just simply does not want to drop the hammer on on Hunter is his, his blind spot again? Well, yeah, you know, White House staffers don't really have any power over yeah, right. Hunter Biden directly. And right. uh, as I go into the book, I think that if you really understand the Biden family story, you can understand this dynamic a little bit better, which is that this is a family that uh, encountered uh, some financial setbacks, uh, had sort of down on their luck relatives living with them often growing up. And, and they developed this ethos that inside this house, we can fight with each other, we can have disagreements, but outside of this house, we're all Bidens and we have to present a united front. Um, and, and so uh, I think that that uh, may help us understand uh, why we've not seen, you know, much visible effort from Joe Biden to sort of rein any of this in or address it or acknowledge uh, the issues that are being raised by ethics experts here. And it sort of creates a, a sticky wicket for for the White House. Yeah, um, ver very, very much so. I mean, I don't know that it's going to be, you know, de you know, determinative in any particular way, but it certainly has, you know, given a lot of ammunition to the people over on Fox News and the usual suspects who are obviously who not only want to portray Joe Biden as somehow compromised, but then use that as a way to 
minimize what uh, what Trump was engaged in. I mean, you know, this is the era of what aboutism, and this is, you know, more than enough to give them some ammunition of, of what aboutism, which is which is un- unfortunate. So. So tell me what what kind of other reaction you've gotten to all of this. Uh, it, 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 I guess I'm going to go back to where, where we started in all of this. There was a sort of this tremendous media appetite for any books about the early days of you know the Trump uh, administration and uh, and of his background. Um, I, I guess I just want to get your kind of sense of this sort of you know strange environment you find yourself in. You were a known Trump critic, and now suddenly you're finding out that you know. You have a new set of friends these days, don't you? I mean, it's kind of the Glenn Greenwald, Sean Hannity world likes your book. And the people that would normally you would have hung around with are going, yeah, Ben who? (laughs) I I would say I was, you know, I was a reporter covering Trump. And, uh, you know, as with any political campaign, I did some some investigative type stories. And uh, because it was the Trump campaign, you know, he he came back swinging pretty hard. Um, yeah, you know, it's been it's I uh, Sean Hannity called the book a blockbuster and and then I've been on with uh with Aaron Mate recently who's, you know, formerly of Democracy Now and is a I would describe as a, you know, a dissident left journalist. Mm-hmm. Um and that's that's sort of been, you know, there was a, some early coverage, a lot of early coverage in in Fox and the New York Post um and now, you know, recently I was on some with someone who's uh, with Matt Taibbi, someone I'd also describe yeah. as sort of left-leaning, but outside of the mainstream fold. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's always interesting to see, uh, you know, where a, a piece or in this case, a book is resonating and and maybe can give you some clues to the, uh, you know, the current fault lines in our politics and our media. So your your day job, you're a national political correspondent for Politico. What are you looking at now? What are you, what's, what's at the top of your agenda? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I've got some profile targets I probably can't talk about. No. Um, uh, I remain tuned into the to the Biden story, the Hunter Biden story, especially. Um, I want to know uh, what's happening with this tax investigation in Delaware. Uh, by all appearances, it's still ongoing, and so I'll I'll keep covering this saga as long as it is unfolding. So because these investigations are ongoing, th- this story is not just historical. I mean, there, there, there are potential minefields for Biden going ahead. I mean, you can imagine what the media environment would be, you know, on the particularly the Fox News media environment would be if, if there were charges involving uh, Hunter Biden. Uh, is, is, has Hunter Biden, I mean, I mean, they are aware of this, right? I mean, they know that this is hanging out there. Obviously. Sure. You know, Obviously. How could you not? Hunter Biden's yet yeah, acknowledge the investigation. So Ron Klain cannot walk into the Oval Office and say, boss, yeah, really, I'm sorry that I have to be the guy to do this. But Hunter is a problem. You need to shut this down it, by shutting it down. I mean, like the art sales and something, not shutting down the, the, the Department of Justice investigation. No. You, what, you know, what I've seen from reporting over the years is that it is uh, very difficult for staff to broach Hunter internally. Uh, there was reporting in the Times a few years ago that goes back to when Joe Biden was being vetted as VP and the Obama team came across some of Hunter's financial dealings back then, his work as a lobbyist, the fact that he was getting money from MBNA, this Delaware bank, whose you know, legislative priority on bankruptcy reform Joe Biden was pushing in Congress. Uh, and Joe Biden reportedly had a very angry response saying, leave my son out of this. Mm -hmm. So I think that's indicative of just how difficult it is to to raise this internally. So they're all sitting around going, you do it. No, you do it. You go in. You be the one to do it. (laughs) Nobody wants to. So the other thing about stepping away from from Hunter for a moment, but with Joe Biden, you know, Joe Biden repeatedly said during the campaign that, you know, he was going to be able to craft these bipartisan uh, deals, work across the aisle that, you know, have a post-toxic political environment. Of course, he did get the infrastructure bill through the Senate, but there's got to be a tremendous amount of frustration now because, uh, and I, I mentioned to you before we started that uh, and I'm, get, I'm getting ratioed on on Kirsten Cinema. I'm trying to remind people that Democrats need all 50 votes here, and the Democratic anger against Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin is truly extraordinary, but it kind of overshadows the fact that they are so crucial because Joe Biden right now has no Republicans that are siding with him on other major initiatives, with the exception of the infrastructure bill, kind of a zero thing. 
Um, you have any sense about that? I mean, it's it's this was a big selling point of Joe Biden that he knew the Senate, that he knew that he could work with people, that it didn't have to be gridlock. And now we're looking at uh, gridlock for as far as the eye can see. Yeah, a big part of the idea of the Biden campaign was a, a return to normalcy and normalcy as Joe Biden knew it over most of his long career in the Senate, especially. Um, but it, it's very possible that that normal there's no normalcy to return to at this point, and that this is uh, not to use the phrase the new normal, but that this really is uh, a status quo uh, that will persist for some time, where there's not uh, a lot of bipartisan cooperation, where brinksmanship is just how legislation is 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 made. Um, Are you surprised by this? Are you surprised by the fact that he can't peel off one or two Republicans that he's been completely unable to break that Mitch McConnell block? You know, I think that uh, it, nothing surprises me anymore. I, <laughs> I watched the rise of Donald Trump in the face well, of, uh, you know, very, very confident uh, prognostication that he would flame out imminently. Uh, and so uh, I think I'm done being surprised. Yeah, I, I I think that it's uh we we've seen things that are much more surprising, but I I do think it's this is a feels like a lost opportunity than to not have even even you know two or three Republicans changes the entire dynamic of government and uh, the the fact that uh, there are none of them um, I don't know you know I hope they understand that it's kind of a disappointment, but again I think this is the problem that Joe Biden has is that. He needs to keep his progressive base in line and needs every single vote. And so he's decided that he's going to tack toward the base rather than do the kinds of outreach that I think that he might have been inclined to, to do earlier. So the book is The Bidens, Inside the First Family's 50-Year Rise to Power by Ben Schreckinger, who is the national political correspondent for Politico. Thanks so much for coming on today, Ben. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me, Charlie. It was great to be here. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.